What is the temple of God? Our bodies are. And um, let, let me read some verses here. Ephesians 2. Um, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles is New Testament. Prophets is Old Testament. Uh, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So what you have is the prophets in this part of your Bible and the apostles in this part of your Bible. But where's Jesus? He's right here in the middle. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John. He is the chief cornerstone binding these two parts together. And you're right, he is all over the Bible, but specifically written of in those four books. Okay, so think of it that way. In, in verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together. See, the, the cornerstone establishes your 90 degree line. You got one wall coming down and you, you're a stonemason and you're, you're truing this stone is what they call it. You're truing this stone, this stone, the building is going to run into it and down this way, it has to be exactly 90 degrees. If it's 91 degrees, it won't make that much of a difference the first 10 feet. But you get down 70, 80, 100 feet and now the wall is is getting away from you, and that building's not going to stand very long. So does this cornerstone have to be perfectly 90 degrees? It has to be, or that house is going to fall. Okay? So if I said, now, there, there are some mistakes in your Bible, but nothing that affects any doctrine. I, am I saying something that's true or not true? If God said all the words were perfect and God said that this cornerstone is true, then he intends for the building that it stands on to last forever. Amen. Amen. So in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So w whenever I heard this, or I would read it years ago, you know, I would think in my mind, okay, I am the temple of God, and God dwells in me, and so on. But I didn't know, I didn't understand how literal it was until... God started showing me some things. 1 Corinthians 3, know ye not that ye are, ye are the temple of God. What is this building? And it's a church. You dedicated it for the, as the house of the Lord for the use of preaching the gospel and, and fellowshipping with the saints and so on. But if this church burnt down, are you still going to have church? Yeah. By the way, thank you for letting me uh, park next to your uh, cemetery. I have to admit, we've stayed in some strange places, but I've never spent the night in a graveyard. <laughs> I'm just glad all the dead Christians are out there and not in here. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. You're the temple of... Now watch this. Verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now let me ask you a question. What defiles the temple of God? What is it that defiles this temple? Beg your pardon? Okay. There you go. So you, guys are, you guys are smarter than the last church I was at, okay? Because they all said, eating bacon, smoking. And I said, and I said, Jesus said, it's not what goes in that defiles. Now, think about that for a minute. This, let's say that this, this pastor's church, together you make the house of the Lord. Okay, that's a reasonable analogy. Okay, now think about what Jesus said. It's not what goes into the body. It's what comes out of the body. And so, whenever you guys leave this building after a service. He's preached the Word of God to you. You've talked about the Word of God. You've fellowshiped with the saints. 
by the Word of God, and everything was about the Word of God. But then you go out of this place and absolutely destroy your testimony while you rub shoulders with lost people. Would that not count as you defiling this body? Because it's defiled by what comes out of it. Amen? See, the preacher's job is to tell you what God said. It is your personal responsibility to respond to that in the way that pleases God. Am I preaching now to you? Amen. That's, that's free, by the way. I don't charge anything for that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Boy, I'd like to read that to some uh, abortion people. It's my body. No, it ain't. That baby has a completely different set of DNA. It's not the woman's DNA, and it's not the man's DNA. That child has its own unique DNA footprint. So it's not her body. By law in this country, that child should have the same rights as you and I have. Amen. Amen. Boy, they get mad when you say things like that. What agreement at the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Revelation 3, him that overcometh. Now, here, I'm going to ask you a question now. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. I mean, I was, one more time. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. So if Jesus said, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? Did he really mean that? Remember, you literally are the temple of God. And I'm going to show you just how real that is in a minute. But if Jesus said that you are going to be a pillar in the temple of his God, it means you are going to be a pillar in the temple of God. Now, I believe that when Jesus comes back, He's going to build his own temple because God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. So they can build all the temples in Jerusalem they want to. Jesus is going to go, I ain't staying in that. He pitches his own tent, Hebrews says. Amen? What is that temple going to look like then? What is it going to be made of? What is Jesus going to make his temple in Jerusalem of what material? Yeah, saints. He ain't going to build it with stone. He ain't going to build it with gold. He's going to build it with... Sa now, I cannot imagine what that's going to look like, but I bet you there has never been an eye seen anything as absolutely amazing as the temple that Jesus himself is going to build in the last days. Whew. Now I'm giving you something to think about. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. That's what, that's what gravity does to us. It makes us go, oh, oh, I don't want to get up today. Not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Hebrews 3, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Meaning that what Moses built was exactly the way God built it up in heaven. Moses followed the example of God. He saw it and he did it exactly the way he saw it. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Let me ask you a question. In your lifetime, if you've been a Christian for most of your life, in your lifetime, have you seen churches go away from the word of God? 
Have you seen people in your lifetime go away from the Word of God? I have too. I grew up, like I said, in my home church, and I worshipped those, those men and women that I grew up under. They were my Sunday school teachers. They were the, the people taking up the offering. They were the, the, the prayer leaders. They were these godly people that I grew up under, and many of them quit serving God. They just quit. Now, I didn't understand that. That bothered me because I really looked up to these people. And I tell my people in my church, we got a bunch of kids in our church. And I'm telling my people all the time, let's not make the mistake of these children looking up to us and seeing us live our life for Christ, even if they understand that we don't do everything right all the time and God's grace is on us, let's not ever let them see us fall away. So he said in Second Peter, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. That's what Peter is saying about himself. He's talking about this flesh body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. First uh, Peter 2, as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone. Christ is the living stone. Stone. When Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar his interpretation of the dream, he said, I saw a stone cut without hands. That means man didn't make the stone Jesus. Jesus, the stone, made man. Amen? We didn't invent Christ. We did not carve him out to suit our needs. Christ always was the rock, the stone, the one the builders rejected. He's the stone that destroys all the kingdoms of this world, and the stone becomes a great mountain. That's what it says. And so that's who Jesus is. Uh, verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner stone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So the temple on earth must match the temple in heaven. In Hebrews 8, for if, if he were on the earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount. Now, this is uh, just a rough sketch of what that tabernacle would have looked like. You have um, the, the, the wall, the curtain that goes around it. Inside is the court. There, um, let me draw, let me do this for you here. Uh, right here, this is, does anybody know what this is? This would be the altar here. And what would this be? The labor where they were to wash. God's a clean God, isn't he? God, God cleans his people. Jesus washes us in the water by the word, does he not? So if your water's dirty and your water's not pure, how can you get washed? So that's what one, that's reason 4,982 why I believe my Bible's right. Amen. You want to hear the other 5,000? This is the sanctuary. This is the holy place right here, you would have the uh, table of showbread on this side, the north side. You would have the seven candlesticks on this side, uh, the south side. And here is the east, and here is the west, because Christ is the sun. And, he, and the, by the way, you're looking at a picture of the universe as well. Because Psalm 19 says that the heavens above are a tabernacle for the sun. And the Son is Christ, who comes out as a bridegroom rejoicing. Jesus is the Son of righteousness, who arises with healing in his wings. So here is East. The sun rises. The high priest goes in here, uh, takes the sacrifice here, takes the blood, goes in here, then goes here to the west, to the most holy place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's, this cloud would represent the, uh, uh, does it represent the Shekinah? Y'all ever heard of the Shekinah glory? Do you know that's not in your Bible? Do you know it's not even in the Hebrew Bible? Do you know what Shekinah is? 
and where it came from, the, the Hebrew word shakan has to do with the presence of God, okay? But that's a masculine word. Shekinah is feminine. And who's ever seen that painting in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, of God, and he's got his finger going out to touch Adam's finger? That's not how it happened, but that's how he painted it. So here's Adam, and he's reaching out to touch God. God is reaching out to touch Adam, and their fingers are like this, right? That, that's God's right hand. Did you ever notice what God was doing with his left hand, his left arm? You go look at this when you get home. He's got his arm around a red-headed, bare-chested woman named Shekinah. Shekinah is the consort of God. And it's filthy. The doctrine is filthy. It is. They have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, just the way Jude said. Okay? So you'll hear preachers talking about, oh, the Shekinah glory came down in our service. You better hope not. Because that Shekinah, you know what her name really is? Thanks. Mystery. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's who she really is. That's extra too. You don't have to pay for that one, all right? So anyway, that's the tabernacle. Now, hang on. This is just sort of a model of every cell in your body. Think of the cells of your body as like little stones that make up like a stone wall or a stone house. And so in this cell, it has a membrane around it or a cell wall if you're a plant. And then here it has, uh, let's see here, where do they have the mitochondria at? I think this would be the mitochondria here. And I'll explain what it does in a minute. You, you'll wish you had listened in 10th grade to biology teacher, okay? You'll wish you had remembered this stuff. Right here is the nucleus, and inside the nucleus is a nucleolus, okay? It's inside the nucleus. Now, why am I showing you this? Because they are the same. Every cell in your body is exactly like this. This is the cell wall. This is the curtain around the cell. The mitochondria here is the altar here. You know what they did on the altar? What did they do on the altar? But what did they do to them? They burnt them. And any offering that people brought all had DNA. If it was, they brought in an ox, it has DNA. They brought in a goat, DNA. Sheep, DNA. Fine flour, flour is seed from a wheat. That's DNA. They bring in olive oil. That came from an olive. The pit of the olive has the DNA in it. Everything that they brought in was food because the Levite priest got a portion of it for their, for their pay, for their salary. Everything that was brought in was food. This, your mitochondria does one thing. It takes the things that you eat, your liver converts them to sugar, the sugar goes into your blood, the blood delivers the sugar to the cell, the cell takes the sugar in and burns it on the mitochondria altar. That's why my head right now is about 99.9 .9 degrees. It's why your body is about 98 degrees, because every cell in your body is burning sugar right now. Burns it for fuel, burns it for heat, okay? And then here is the nucleus. That's this right here, the holy place. Inside the nucleus is the nucleolus. Remember what was back here? The Ark of the Covenant. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Do you know? One very important thing inside the Ark of the Covenant.
God told Moses to, when he wrote down the law, the book of the law, to take it and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. That's where your DNA is. Take your Bible to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I had a, a medical doctor, an ER doctor, Dr. Chuck Thurston. Funny guy. He's got a sense of humor, humor like me. And we just get together and laugh. He showed me that every cell in my body was a picture of the wilderness tabernacle. So now... If God said that this body is his dwelling place, how real is that? It's exactly, the cells of my body are exactly the way the temple up in heaven is built. And God dwells in every one of them. You know how? In the book. In the beginning was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Thy Word have I hid in my, that I might not sin against God. So God is in this book, and this book is God. You cannot separate one from the other. When Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, He has a name written on Him, the Word of God. So that makes it pretty plain, doesn't it? John said he's the Word. In fact, seven times in the King James Bible, the Word, capital W, is in this book. Seven times. And all of them refer to Christ. So, Psalm 139. Are you there? I'm not. Oh, I am now. I turn right to it. Look at there. Look at verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Look at the next four words. And in thy book. What I say the book was a reference to? The Bible. In thy book, all my members were written. Think about this for a minute. So this is a body. This is a church body. And you know, and God knows, whether or not your name is written in the book of life. So when David said, in thy book, all my members were written, you understand now that one application is everybody in this room, hopefully everybody in this room, I don't know you. And I won't just say just because you're sitting here smiling at me that you're born again. But I'm going to ask you, is your name written in God's book of life? For whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's your only alternative. So are you written in God's book? In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. Now, how many of you did not go to this church five years ago? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you did not go to this church ten years ago? Okay. Who's been here forever? <laughs> Young lady, God bless you. <laughs> All right. I don't know how old this church is, okay? But uh, out of all the people in, in our church... I've been there the long, I've been there since 74. I've been there, well, the first service I remember going to, they had a building dedication service. And I said, Mom, I like this church because they had singing and fried chicken. <laughs> Amen. That's what it should be. Amen. So, which in continuance was fashioned, because some of you weren't here five years ago, but you're here now. God is still fashioning this church, is he not? 
And just think about all the people that live in this area that have yet to come and be a part of this church, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. There was a time when this church did not exist, but God laid it on the heart of some people to form a church. They put their money together. They built a building. They got them a pastor. People came to this church. They were saved in this church. They were baptized in this baptistry. They said amen to sermons in this church. God is fashioned this church as we're speaking right now, but there was a time when it didn't exist. Now, I'm going to show you another interpretation of this verse, this same verse. Um, let's see if I have a picture of it. Come on. That's the part about insulin I was going to show you. Hang on here. In fact, let me do this the, the cheap way here. Who in here knows what deoxyribonucleic acid is? Thank you very much. DNA. Remember I said earlier where you have the prophets on this side, you have the apostles on this side, and who's the chief cornerstone in the middle? Jesus Christ. Okay? Let me show you something. DNA is a double helix. When it's straightened out, what does it look like? A ladder. Can you think of a story in the Bible that has a ladder in it? Ladder. Hey, that's pretty good. Y'all are smart. Notice that there are two legs to the ladder. This is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. And they're bound together. Because seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, no one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. In Isaiah 28, God said, uh, for the word shall be here a little, there a little, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. Paul said that when we're reading the Bible, we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So spiritual things from the Old Testament compared to spiritual things in the New Testament, and they always match, don't they? So if you have a lamb on the day of Passover in the Old Testament, you have a lamb now in the New Testament, and we know who it is. Those two testaments are bound together, and what did we say in this book joins them all together? Jesus Christ, but specifically how in this book? The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What joins this leg of the ladder with this leg of the ladder are four base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. You will have to tell me those back before I let you leave the building tonight. Yeah, better get comfortable. Adenine, th adenine and thymine go together. Adenine and guanine do not. So in this interesting... You have guanine and cytosine, they go together. Adenine and thymine, they go together. You have two, two of the four Gospels contain the story of the birth of Christ. Two of them don't. Mark and uh, John do not have the story of the birth of Christ. They start at Jesus' baptism with John the Baptist. But Matthew and Luke tell the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. They go together, don't they? And the other two go together. So whenever your cell, the whole function of a cell is to do, like if it's a skin cell or if it's a, a heart tissue cells or blood cells, the whole point is to do what it is the body needs to be done. But then also... Get this now, the duty of the cell is to make new cells. Amen. New cells are new people in this church that are not here yet. They're out there. It's your job to bring them in. So what happens when this cell is going to make a new cell? It takes the DNA and it straightens it all out. It divides it down the middle. One half of it 
stays in the old cell, one half of it goes to the new cell. Now, how does it know how to put it back together again? If it's adenine here, it has to be thymine here. And if it's guanine here, it has to be cytosine here. And so God built it into that, that it knows exactly how to put itself and make the other half of the DNA. Because if it's one thing here, it's this thing over here. It follows the rules. And so with the new cell, uh, this is what I like. With the new cell, the new cell has exactly the same DNA as the old cell does. So let's say that you know somebody that, boy, he really wants to know the Lord. So you and the preacher go out to his house and talk to him. He bows there in his house and he gets saved. And boy, I mean, there was rejoicing. He's crying. Then his wife gets saved. Then his kids get in involved in it. They all get saved. And then this preacher says, now, you guys are, are, t are young Christians, and I don't expect that you'll read the King James. So I got some NIVs out in the car. I'm going to go bring them in for you. You wouldn't do that, would you? Well, you I see the look I'm getting from him. <laughs> anyway, you wouldn't do that. You would say, this is the word of God. You don't need, if you don't have Bibles, we're going to get you Bibles for you. So that when he's preaching and he says, turn to Joshua chapter 6, then everybody turns to Joshua chapter 6 and they're all hearing and reading the exact same thing as coming from the pulpit. God blesses that. Amen? God blesses that. So those, now... Think about this. Remember what we said John 1 said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God? To me, it's interesting that these two legs of the ladder, let's, this one's Old Testament, this one's New Testament, but what actually makes the genes that make our body are contained right here in the middle in these four base pairs. In other words, what makes the whole Bible make sense and ties everything together is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You take those out, you can't understand anything from this book. It doesn't make sense. So the word was right here in those base pairs. By the way, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Do you know what that means? Optic means look. Synoptic means they look alike. When you read Matthew, you read Luke, you notice that they're basically giving you the same story, pretty much the same words in the dialogue and so on. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are like that. John is different. John doesn't follow any of the stories that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do except the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. John is completely different. You want to see something? In the midst of these four base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, I won't get into the business of telling you how, but adenine, cytosine, and guanine are almost identical. Thymine's different. In fact, you can take that principle and go... Anywhere in your Bible where you've got four things, three of them are going to be the same. One of them is going to be different. So let me give you some names. Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah. Which one's different? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay. And by the way, I've, I've picked this out when I was visiting the ark out in Kentucky. Has anybody ever been out there and seen that thing? I went out there and I went... Oh, my goodness. It was amazing. And as you're going in, they're playing this video of how all these people, it's like one of those fast videos where they take a picture every day and they put it together and make a movie and they show you how that ark was built. And I mean, you've got people running uh, forklifts and you got people uh, on cranes and you got guys wearing hard hats and you had electricians, you had plumbers in there, you had carpenters, you had all the people that designed it, the people that engineered it, the people who dug the ground out, the people who put all the furnishings in and painted everything. There must have been thousands of people work on that thing. And it occurred to me 
the one that Noah built, only four guys did it. But then it hit me. The ark was salvation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They were saved by the four. Um, Rachel, Leah, Billa, Zilpah. Three the same, one's different. Who's different? Rachel is. Okay. Um, give me another one. And who's with them? The Son of God is with them. The fourth. It even tells you the fourth is the Son of God. He's the one that's different from the other three. Isn't that something? Do you know what all of the modern Bibles say in Daniel 3.25? The fourth one is like a son of the gods. NIV, Holman Christian Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible, English Standard Version, you name it. All of those modern Bibles take out the Son of God and replace Him with a Son of the gods. That's enough for me right there to not want that Bible. Mm -mm -mm. Um, tell you what. Let me, let me, I'm going to do two things I'm going to cut you loose here, okay? Number one, when Moses built this tabernacle... God specifically said that on the north side, which is up here to your right, there was to be 20 boards. On the south side, the opposite of it, there was to be 20 boards. Going across the back, there was supposed to be six boards. So how many boards making up that tabernacle? 46. You, your, your DNA is bundled up into 46 packages called chromosomes. Okay, 23 pairs, 46 all together. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. When you are conceived in your mother's womb... Your father contributed 23 chromosomes. Your mother contributed 23 chromosomes. You are the one flesh by the joining of the two. See, that Bible's literal. The two shall be one flesh. You are the living proof of that. You are the one flesh that comes from the two. And remember, your daddy had 23 chromosomes, your mama had 23 chromosomes, now you've got 46. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look in verse 23 of all verses. 23, and see where it says, and Adam said? I want you to count, after Adam said, I want you to count the number of words that are in verse 23 and 24. I'll give you a minute or two to count those out. Start with, this is now bone of my bones. Start there. How many? 46 words exactly. And look at what it says. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And it's 46 words. You think man did that? Or that's just a dime that somebody dropped on the sidewalk. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to show you something else along those same lines. Um, when Solomon built his temple, he was told to put two pillars 
in the beginning of it, the opening of it. One was called Jachin, one was called Boaz. Now remember the temple, it's a picture of the tabernacle, it's a picture of your cells. So, Jachin was 18 cubits tall, but the chapter or capital on top of it was five cubits. What is 18 plus five? So, Jachin was 23 cubits tall, Boaz was 23 cubits tall. What do you have? 46, and the Ark of the Covenant was in there, and the book was inside of it, the DNA. Isn't that something? I ain't done. Oh, yeah, I am. Sorry. Do you remember when Jesus was looking at the temple? They were showing Jesus all the buildings of the temple. You remember that? And Jesus said, um, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Remember what he said? Do you remember what the Jews told him? They said, 40 and six years was this temple in building. Now, I didn't put that in the Bible. I'm not the one who it took 46 years to build a temple. God did that. So now, go to the 46th book of the Bible. Oh, this is easy. But it's 1 Corinthians where it says, Know ye not that you're the temple of God. Isn't that amazing? This Bible is... Turn to Revelation chapter 4 now. And I'm going to be done. Okay? Let's see here. Am I, am I in the right spot? Revelation chapter 4. Oh, yeah. Let's read this together. Because this is where John gets to see what Ezekiel saw. He gets to see the throne of God. So in Revelation chapter 4, after this... I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. Now notice verse two. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Guess who that one was? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You know what the NIV and the newer translations say with this verse? Someone was sitting on it. Did that make you mad? So anyway, verse uh, 3, He that sat was to look upon like a jasper to sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne. That's what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1, in sight like unto an emerald. And notice this in verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the, uh, the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, uh, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Uh, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had the face of as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not. Oh, I like this. It's, this is better than a whippoorwill. They rest not day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Amen. I don't think we'll get tired of listening to that. Amen. Now, watch this. Where does Jesus live in you right now? In your heart. Your heart is the throne of God that we just read about in Revelation 4. One, only one can sit on the throne of your heart. Amen? Remember what's said of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2? So that he is God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What did we say the temple of God was? The body, the human body. It's actually all humans because all humans are built exactly the same way I'm going to show you in a minute. So the Antichrist, in my opinion, 
He's not going to sit in some temple somewhere. He's going to sit in the temple of God, showing that he is God. There's only room for one on that throne. Amen? So, your heart, how many chambers does it have? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, lion, ox, man, flying eagle. The four living creatures. How many men carried the Ark of the Covenant? Because they had to match what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1 and what John saw in Revelation 4. The four living creatures carrying the throne of God. By the way, out of the four chambers of your heart, one of them is different than the rest of them. One of them is the chamber that pushes all the blood into your body. The other three are responsible for taking it out, cleansing it, purifying it. But that fourth chamber is different. It's the one that gives you life. Okay? So, we, we have the heart. We have the four chambers, which are the four living creatures and the four gospels. Notice that it said, verse 6, And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Do you know what surrounds your heart? Does anybody know? It's a sac of water called a pericardium. It's the sea of glass, clear as crystal, that surrounds the throne of God. In Ezekiel 28, the prince of Tyrus, which is Satan, said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, is what he said. He wants to sit in the throne of every human body and rule from there. You see, if some guy... 20,000 miles away over in the Middle East tells you what to do, you don't have to do it, do you? But if he literally is inside of every body, then they'll do exactly what he tells them because it's in their heart, isn't it? You want to know something else about your heart I found out? Your heart has in it the same kind of cells as what's in your brain. It has neurons in it. You use the neurons in your, or you're supposed to, you use the neurons in your brain to think, right? So why would you have neurons in your heart? Because with the heart, man believeth. Your heart literally thinks. And when somebody, when somebody tells to your brain to do something, you may or may not do it. But if you put that in your heart, you're going to do it, aren't you? We always do what's in our heart, don't we? That's what Jesus said. It's what proceeded out of the heart of man. That's what defiles it. Let me move on. So we have the sea of glass now. It's the pericardium, right? Then we have thunderings, lightnings, and voices. What sound does your heart make when it pumps? like thunder. And what causes your heart to pump? Electricity, lightning. Where's your voice box? Right here. Your heart's here. You have thunderings and lightnings, and you have voices right here, all contained in this area here. Then, get this. Look in um, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits. Where does the word spirit come from? Respiration? Breath. Breath is what the spirit is. What did they hear on the day of Pentecost? The rushing tub of water? No, a rushing mighty wind. That was the spirit, wasn't it? So what part of your body deals with air? Watch this. How many spirits were there? One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven. That's your lungs. Seven spirits right there in your lungs. And that's something. You know what it looks like? You turn it upside down. What does that look like to you? You see, the, the candlestick in the temple looked like an almond tree. It had buds on it. It had uh, flowers. And it had little knobs on it. In fact, oh my goodness, you guys are going to be so mad at me for taking all this time. This is exciting to me. I love talking about this. God said that on every pipe of the, of the candlestick, I want a flower, a bud, and a bowl. Three decorations. But on each branch, there were three sets of three decorations. So you have on the outside pipe there where the arrows are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have nine on three on the right side, nine on three on the left side, but then I have four sets of decorations. That's 12 in the middle. So when I add them all up, I have 27 decorations, 12 decorations, and then 27 more. So I have 39 on the left side, and I have 27 on the right side. What have I just showed you? The number of books in the Bible. There's 39 in the Old Testament. There's 27 in the New Testament, which means that there are 66 total. God put it in the tabernacle of Moses some three, 4,000 years ago. How many books was going to be in our Bible? Wow. Yeah, say wow backwards. Wow. Amen. <laughs> All right, hang on, hang on. We're almost done. So remember, it looked like a tree, didn't it? Oh, you're going to like this. There it is. So here's another picture of it. Look at that. And isn't it something that we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out what? And trees breathe in and breathe out. Amen, amen. There's the seven <coughs> candlesticks right there. <coughs> then, oh, I'm, I'm almost done now. This is it right here. We're getting right down to the wire back in Revelation chapter 4. What did he say surrounded all of that? What did he say? Look at verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. So four and twenty is what? Twenty-four? So twenty-four elders, and they surrounded the throne. Ready? You have twelve ribs on one side, twelve on the other, and they surround the throne. If God said... You're the temple. Your body is the temple. Did he mean it? Yes. Listen, I got the opportunity back in 2014 to go 10 miles out of a town called uh, Magori, Kenya. The devil was all over me trying to stop me from going out there. We went out there with Brother Mike Hutzel and his son Brent. And the devil was eating me up, not wanting me to go out there. But I went. And we're like 10 miles out of town. We're out in the country. And those folks, they, they, they're country folks just like you folks are. They got their land. They grow their crops. They live off that land. They're out there. Nobody thinks of them. But we went out there and held a little revival for them. And the first thing I showed them, those African people out there, I said, the world has never thought much of you Africans here. They've used you. They beat you. They've sold you as slaves. But I showed them this, and they rejoiced, they wept. I said, God made you his temple. And I'll tell you what, there was some dancing going on. And shout, and people crying all over the place. Because while they may not have been significant as far as this world, God had made them to be his well. -known. I'm going to ask you tonight, and I'm going to let the pastor take the service, but I'm going to ask you tonight, are you God's dwelling place? 
does God. See, you see how glory, how much glory is here? For God to make it exactly the way it says in the Bible. Do you not see how special you are to God? He loves you. He made you. And he desires to dwell in the house that he made. Will you let him?